So my topic is uh, question mark uranium mining in the Black Hills. And I'm going to cover three basic topics. Uh, how can uranium be mined? What are the potential health, environmental, and economic impacts? And then what are the companies involved currently in the Black Hills? Uh, uranium is a naturally occurring element. Um, it's used in nuclear power, nuclear weapons, and nuclear medicine. It's generally not dangerous if it's left in the ground unless you drilled your well directly into a uranium deposit. But however, when it's brought to the surface and concentrated, it emits, emits dangerous levels of radiation. The uranium breaks down into a series of other materials. And some of those include radon and radium, are two that you might have heard of. Eventually, it, it breaks down into a, a non-harmful form of lead. That's in about 4.3 billion years. In the meantime, there are this whole series of radioactive substances uh, that are created. This is just a quick uh, map that was done uh, back in about 1980, actually. And what it shows is the rim of the Black Hills, the, the, where there, this whole rim is the Indian Kara Formation, that's where the uranium is found in the Black Hills. The black boxes are claims and leases back in the 1980s, so you can sort of see the extent of the activity then. There is now activity up in here, which we'll talk about in a bit. And then these letters are just some of the companies that were involved at the time. But that gives you some idea of where uranium is in the Black Hills. Uh, current markets for uranium are primarily China and India. The uh, Cameco company sends uh, ships its uranium. This is the company, not the company that's active right here, but uh, one of the companies that's active in our region. It ships its uranium, uh, enriched uranium through Canada and sends it by boats to China. Uh, like I said, India is the other growing market. Local companies also have ownership uh, by Belgium, France, Russia, uh, so there are a variety of companies and a variety of places that this uranium might go. So how can uranium be mined? The kind that you're probably most familiar with, or at least one of the kinds you're most familiar with, is underground mining. Dig a hole, a tunnel, go in, mine it. Uh, it's the most dangerous to miners because of their exposure to radon gas. Um, it used to be that it was a pick and shovel operation. Uh, nowadays, it's uh, highly tech, just like most things have gotten uh, much more technological. A uh, second kind of mining, and the kind that's proposed for Fall River County and Custer County, is in situ leach mining. It takes place in an aquifer. It can only happen in groundwater. Right? And what happens is the extraction liquid, the solution, is pumped underground is pumped through the uranium deposit. It picks up the uranium as well as heavy metals and other things that are found with the uranium. And then it is pumped back to the surface. And the uh, uranium and other metals are then taken out of the extraction liquid. It's refurbished with solution as needed and used again. So this shows you the process. I'm not sure if you can see the arrows way in the back, uh, but this shows the process for you. Uh, this is uh, uh, an in situ leach mine, so you can get a picture of what they look like above the ground. Most of the mining activity is hidden underground, but above ground there are processing facilities. Uh, there are large ponds, uh, for example, radium settling ponds, uh, wastewater ponds, um, and uh, this is an open processing situation. There would be uh, building over processing in some of the proposed activities around here. But this is a lot easier to see what's happening. This is an in situ leach operation in Wyoming from space. And I really doubt you're going to be able to see this way from way in the back. But each one of these dots is a place where they've been drilling for uranium for the in situ operation. So you can see that it, it strips the land of vegetation. And it's quite extensive. And it's big enough that this Wyoming uh, mine, you can see it from space. <coughs> This is a ground view of that same uranium mine uh, where it shows some of the um, way that the land is used. The white 
of canisters, I guess you call them, are wellheads for the actual mining. And then, of course, they drive over the land and, and uh, pipe things around. The pipes are also the end of the ground. After mining, the uranium is chemically uh, removed from the mining solution, attached to little resin beads that look like vitamin E capsules. And then those are transported to a tra processing plant where it's purified into yellow cake. That's what uh, is U308, and that's what it's called. And this is what it looks like in a 55 gallon drum, uh, which is um, where, how it's shipped out then in a truck to somewhere else. The third kind of uranium mining is open pit mining. Dig a big hole, scoop it out, uh, send it to a mill. And this is uh, what the mill is the kind of mill we used to have in Edgemont, for those of you who remember that. There are large tailings piles like this. The whole operation is much more visible than an in situ leach uranium mine. Um, according to Environmental Protection Agency databases, um, this is approximately how many abandoned mines and prospects for uranium there are in South Dakota. About 103 up in Harding County up in the northwest corner of the state, about 169 in the southern Black Hills, and then as I mentioned, and as many of you remember, the old mill in Edgemont. These were mined in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Mostly they were small mines, small operations. Um, the Darrow Pits was one of the larger operations. There's a picture of that here. In the late 1970s, the uranium companies came in and they wanted to start uranium mining up again. And at that time, people in the Black Hills stopped it from starting again. So there hasn't been uranium mining in the Black Hills since the early 1970s. The uranium mill was stationed on Cottonwood Creek. Uh, there was both air and water pollution from the wastes from the mill, the tailings, which are like sand that blew around. Also, some people used it because it was like sand to make concrete for the basements of their house and for the schoolyard. So when this was cleaned up by the federal government, um, they took out all the places they knew of where the sand had settled in or been used. And I, there is a picture of the old Edgemont mill around. I couldn't find one. This is the White Mesa Mill in Utah. So only a handful of mines from the 50s, 60s, and 70s have been reclaimed. Um, according to studies by the South Dakota School of Mines, there's pollution um, from the Harding County mines 20 and 30 miles downstream. And that's measurable. The uh, contaminants on some of these mines are hundred, hundreds of times the background level, which is the level if you're away from uranium mining operations. And this is a picture of the Ridge Runner mine, an underground mine. There are also vertical leaks from the old exploration holes. We'll come back to vertical leaks in a minute. It basically means leaks up and down old wells that were dill, drilled for exploration purposes. There was a spill of tailings or the waste material at the Edgemont Mill in 1962. This contaminated Angostura Reservoir. There are also a number, or were a number when the study I read was done, of unmarked vents and shafts around the old mining sites. Um, and then there was also radiation from mining, from human activity measured, coming out of Cascade Springs and the Indian Care Formation coming across from the western part of the Southern Hills. So let's look at potential health impacts. The main health threats of our toxicity and radiation. And radiation is the one that people usually talk about, but uranium is also toxic. Radiation does damage at a cellular level. It causes things like cancer, lupus, diabetes, and the toxic toxicity of uranium leads to kidney damage. The uh, effects are more dangerous to the very young, the very old, and those who have other health problems. The National Academy of Sciences, which is our nation's <coughs> I will try not to clear my throat into the microphone. Um, <laughs> the leading scientists and scholars in the U.S., uh, they periodically do studies and reports on radiation. They said in 2006, the most recent one of these reports, 
that there is no safe level of exposure to radiation. They've been saying that for years and years and years. Um, any exposure can cause changes which lead to cancer. And the more exposure a person has, the higher the risk. Now, in light of this, the Colorado Medical Society, which is the organization of physicians in Colorado, uh, did something highly unusual. They passed a resolution in 2007 against uranium mining in the area that, um, that the original people were from who started the resolution. Uh, 6,800 physicians, they felt strongly enough about this issue to take this rather unusual step. There's a copy of the resolution back at the back table. Uh, another study that's been done that was done properly, and there are a lot of them that have been done poorly, but another one that was done properly was done on uh, the Navajo in the southwest. Uh, they compared people who lived in uranium mining and milling areas to people who did not live in uranium mining and milling areas. They found that the people who lived in or near or lived near uranium facilities had a 1,500% increase in testicular and ovarian cancer in children. 500% increase in bone cancer in children, 250% increase in leukemia, and a 200% increase in miscarriage and abnormalities and those kinds of things. <clears throat> in Fall River County, if you don't already know this, or I'm sorry to tell you if you uh, didn't already know this, uh, according to the Centers for Disease Control, the death rate from cancer in this county is 41% higher than the state average. The annual incidence rate for cancer, in other words, how many people have cancer in a given year, is second in the state. So um, you can't, there was no studies done before uranium mining to say it was this before uranium mining, and now this is what it is after uranium mining. What we can say is that this county where there's been a lot of uranium mining there's also a high cancer rate. So let's look at some potential environmental impacts. One thing people don't realize is that there's radiation exposure at all stages of the nuclear process. So starting with exploration for uranium, mining, milling, transportation, <clears throat> there are a series of steps of enrichment, and then of course nuclear power plants, nuclear weapons, and high-level nuclear waste disposal, which nobody has a way to do yet. They've been working on this for genera a couple generations now. So uranium mining is not just a local issue. It impacts people over a wide area. Common types of water contamination from uranium uh, mining and from in situ leach operations in particular are problems with wastewater retention ponds in which the wastewater you know, spills either because there's a leak in the pond, the liner of the pond gets a hole in it somehow, or because it's washed out of the pond. The largest nuclear accident in U.S. history was not the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant. That was minor compared to the largest nuclear accident in U.S. history, which was when a dam broke in New Mexico at a uranium milling pond. Now back to vertical leaks, which I mentioned briefly before. Here again you see the same kind of a setup with, that we have with the NC2 leach mining, where there are levels of water aquifers. Um, there is the solution pumped down and through the uranium and back to the surface. But with vertical leaks, we have the old abandoned drill holes here. And what happens is those drill holes didn't have to be filled back in the 50s and 60s. There were no laws to make anybody fill them. So what happens sometimes, and we know this happens on the proposed power tech mining site, is that water moves up and down through different layers of rock and from one aquifer to another. So there's not a control of uh, the pollution, the contamination. Other kinds of water contamination we see with in situ operations are horizontal movement of the water. In other words, it's moving across the aquifer this way. That's called an excursion. It's like the contamination goes for a walk. Okay, that's called an excursion. 
And then the other problems we have are failure of pipe or pumping or pumps. There's a lot of pressure as this operation happens. And if a pump fails or a pipe fails, you end up with leaks or you end up with excursions. Now I want to talk about some modern in situ leach projects. And, and I want to talk about this partly because people sometimes say, um, all the problems with uranium mining are in the past. Modern uranium mining doesn't have problems. And that's not true. And I want to give some examples. Um, Smith Ranch and Highland Mines in Wyoming, the ones we saw from space, uh, there was a notice of violation from the Wyoming Department of Environmental Quality back in 2008. And they said that at the site there was, and this is a quote, an inordinate number of spills, leaks, and other releases. There was both surface water and groundwater contamination, and restoration at the mine site at that time had taken 10 years, <clears throat> which was two to three times longer than expected. And even after that, the groundwater at the site was the same quality as when mining had stopped. Another modern in situ project in Wyoming, the Christensen Ranch <coughs> mine. Um, the most commonly used aquifer there, which is a shallow aquifer, in places had a 100 foot drawdown. Again, per the Wyoming Department of Environmental Quality, there was an excursion and the company and the regulars, regulators couldn't figure out what caused it and they couldn't figure out how to stop it. And wells outside the mine area that used to produce 10 gallons a minute of water were now producing less than a quart a minute. Another one, and this is the Pearl Butte mine in northwestern Nebraska down by Crawford. They've had 56 violations of their license from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. A violation notice from the Nebraska Department of Environmental Quality in 2008 pointed out that the company had released water onto the ground for two years without reporting it. They had constructed wells in a way that could allow contamination of drinking water. They had failed to report the problems. The Crow Butte mine was evacuated because of wildfire this past summer, which is also an issue at the proposed PowerTech site. As you all know, there have been a number of fires right around that area in the last year and a half. And there are water problems north of the site in Wyoming, part in Nebraska. The U.S. Geological Survey says, and I'm quoting, to date, no remediation of an ISR leach operation in the United States has successfully returned the aquifer to baseline conditions. Often at the end of monitoring, which is after mine has been closed, contaminants to continue to increase. So even after the mine is supposedly cleaned up, contamination is still getting worse. And this has been true at a number of mine sites that I've seen the studies for. Nuclear Regulatory Commission in 2010, talking about the same topic. To date, restoration to background water quality for all constituents has proven to be practically, not practically achievable. By constituents, they mean contaminants. So contamination could include uranium, radium, arsenic, lead, molybdenum, a whole variety of things. So let's look at the potential economic impacts. PowerTech Uranium Company has applied for permits to take 8,500 gallons per minute out of the Indian Cara aquifer and 551 gallons per minute from the Madison aquifer. That's 94 billion gallons of water over a 20-year project. Average Rapid City Wells production is 6,735 gallons per minute, just to give you some idea of the scale of the amount of water we're talking about. Now the bottom line is that even if PowerTech reuses the water, which they are likely to do for the mining process, like I said, it's recirculated, even if they reuse it, 
even if they say they won't use 9,000 gallons per minute, the reality is that a state permit to pump 9,000 gallons per minute would mean they have the right to pump 9,000 gallons per minute okay, for 20 years. They could sell the water, they could pump it elsewhere, they could end up mining water as much as uranium if they get these permits. Now what the company says, this is from the company's publications, is that they will consume or use up 2.76 billion gallons of water during mining. Other water they say would be reused. They say the reused water, out of the reused water, at least 30% would eventually become waste. Um, it's from what's called the reverse osmosis process, that there's waste water, and the numbers vary hugely in terms of how much would be waste water and how much would not. So 30% is the low number. Um, the waste water would then either and or, I guess I should say, <clears throat> be pumped into the Minnelusa or Deadwood Aquifer, or it would be sprayed on the land with a center pivot um, irrigation type of setup, over a thousand acres of uh, sprayed in areas where the water would be sprayed on the ground. <clears throat> the mining industry has what's called a boom and bust cycle. You see this wherever there's mining. There is a boom when the mining starts, there's a bust when the mining ends. Okay? Because when you're mining something, it always runs out. Edgemont is a victim, its economy is a victim of the last uranium mine bust. So that's something to keep in mind. In terms of uranium mining jobs, uh, there would be short term, case. very few of the jobs would last for the whole project. According to the project director, Mark Hollenbeck, uh, the end of last month, he said many of the jobs will be professional and technical jobs requiring degrees available at the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. So there will be little hiring from Fall River or Custer counties looking for degrees in chemistry and engineering. So if you've got those, then the project starts, you'd be in luck. Otherwise, you wouldn't. Even if the project hires all the people PowerTech says they will hire, even if it hires them for a long time and the project goes on for 20 years, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in its study of the project says the economic impact would still be small. That's the word they use. Now in terms of energy alternatives, the easy one is renewables. South Dakota, North Dakota, Texas, Kansas, Montana, and Nebraska each have more wind energy potential than the electricity produced by all U.S. nuclear power plants. So it's an economic choice. And the most recent study on this choice is done by Southwick Associates. It was done last year. And what they did was they studied rural counties in the West. And they looked at counties that depended on resource extraction, like mining. And they looked at counties that depended on recreation and tourism and conservation. And they found out that the counties that are managed for conservation and recreation have greater economic success, including higher home prices and more jobs. So let's look a bit at what is planned. My microphone hand is getting a little tired here. <laughs> okay, there are about six that we know of, at least six companies that are active in the uranium industry in the Black Hills, in the western Black Hills in particular. Along the northwestern part of the hills, the stars indicate where projects are proposed. Um, this, again, print is probably going to be too small for those of you in the back. It lists the names of some of the projects, the companies involved, although they're, they're bought out regularly, the names change regularly, and then the acreage involved. 25,000 acre projects, a couple of those, an 18,000 acre project, and a 13,000 acre project. Those are on the northwest part of the Black Hills. PowerTech Uranium is the most active and visible company uh, in this area. Their proposed Dewey Burdock project is on the Wyoming border. 
uh, right around Dewey and Burnock, since I'm actually talking to an audience that knows where that is, and uh, in the, on the Custer Fall River County line. Besides mining uranium there, they want to have a regional uranium processing plant uh, that would take uranium from around the area and process it. They're a Canadian company. They've never mined uranium. But some of their leaders have a history of past uranium projects that were problem. An example comes from Moab, Utah, where there is a uranium facility right on the banks of the Colorado River. This is the Colorado River. I put a black line around this to sort of emphasize it, but these are uranium waste, uranium tailings from a mill. The mill stopped operating in 1984. They left about 16 million cubic yards of tailings and contaminated soil over 130 acres in an unlined impoundment. Nothing under it, no lining under it. PowerTex VP of Environmental Health and Safety Resources, Richard Blubaugh, was in charge of cleaning up that site for the company Atlas Minerals. Atlas declared bankruptcy in 1998, leaving the tailings piles. And now taxpayers are paying for cleanup at the rate of tens of millions of dollars. Uh, in the Black Hills, the company is trying to get permits from a regular alphabet soup of state and federal agencies, and I'm going to let our next speaker talk about that more. Uh, originally, they were their application was turned down by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for being incomplete. Um, eventually, they. Uh, agency, the NRC, suspended the safety application for the project because PowerTech was not providing the answers the agency needed quickly enough. There will be hearings on this uh, permit, the NRC permit. Uh, our next speaker will talk about that more as well. And the draft supplemental environmental impact statement, which is the statement of the environmental impacts that the project might have, has been published. <laughs> And many of you have made comments on it. The uh, comments on that the federal government would do today. There are some there is some information on the back table on that. If you get done and you want to still send comments in, you can still get them in today or early tomorrow. In the Black Hills, at the state level, uh, PowerTech's mining permit application was turned down as incomplete by the State Department of Environmental and Natural Resources twice. They uh, introduced a bill to stop the regulations that cover in situ leach uranium mining. The company did. It passed in 2011. So we don't have state regulation of this kind of mining except for a general mining permit. There's no monitoring, there's no regular monitoring of ISL uranium mines in South Dakota. <coughs> A quote from Dr. Ronald Sass at Rice University. He says, although in situ leaching is highly regulated, both by the state and by the federal government, the regulations that have been followed for more than 30 years appear to be faulty and do not adequately protect the local groundwater from excessive contamination by uranium and radium. Uranium mining is outright prohibited in some places. Those places are listed here. It includes the state of Virginia, several Australian states, Denmark, Ireland, uh, about half of the Canadian provinces, Navajo Nation, Greenland, and James Bay Creek. Now, in terms of what you can do if you want to oppose proposed mining, is to realize, first of all, that uranium mining has been stopped before. It has been stopped here before. It has been stopped elsewhere before. Stopping one permit would stop the mining. Things that you can do, and I know some people here have already been actively involved in writing letters to the editor and forum articles. Um, you can also write and call your state representatives or the governor. You can donate money to the groups that are working on this issue. And of course, you can join in and help out. So in summary, all methods of mining uranium pose threats to health, the environment, and the economy. At least six companies are active in the Black Hills. 
In situ leach mining is proposed, and uranium mining can be and has been 